I'm Connor Old, and welcome back to another episode of Forgotten Oscar Films. And this week, we're going to be looking at the 1995 Oscars and looking at an international movie that was nominated after a 20-year lull of an international movie getting nominated for Best Picture. And even though it was a historical moment at the time, it was not like a parasite and it has sort of been forgotten over the years. And in this episode, we're going to try to answer that question. But if you're new to the series, what I do every single week is I pick a movie that was nominated for Best Picture that I think has been forgotten to time, a movie that isn't as well celebrated or talked about or remembered. Um, the first part of the show, I talk about the historical context, why I got nominated, a little bit of history of the 1995 Oscars, then I give my thoughts on the actual movie because oftentimes I'm seeing this movie for the very first time. And then finally, trying to answer that question because of those factors that we established, why this movie was forgotten and not some of the other nominees and why I ultimately chose this movie to cover. And this year was the 1995 Oscars and in many ways, Braveheart, the Best Picture winner, was a very atypical Best Picture winner in the 90s. Even though it was a surprise at the time, Mel Gibson did win DGA, it didn't get a SAG nomination, which was a big thing at the time. At the end of the day, this was the movie that appealed to the Academy voters. You know, last week we talked about 1996's The English Patient. Um, 1997, we talked about Titanic. As, as a matter of fact, if I think you could argue that eight out of the 10 Best Picture winners from the 90s all have this sort of common genre theme in the sense that they are all over two and a half hours, two hours, 15 minutes long. They're all period movies and they're all these sort of epic kind of movies. You know, Braveheart, Titanic, Dances with Wolves. The English Patient, they are all in the same sort of vein. Um, another common theme uh, from these sort of Best Picture winners was the actor turned director, that the Academy has always been sort of favorable to guys like um, Robert Redford when he won for Best Director for Ordinary People, including Best Picture. Uh, Kevin Costner does it in Dances with Wolves, who you may be covering in a few episodes. And then here, once again, Mel Gibson does it. So while it was a little bit of a surprise at the time, I think that the movie still had a, a rabid fan base despite sort of Mel Gibson's um, controversial status. And in many ways is a classic kind of 90s Best Picture winner. So so I didn't want to cover it for that reason, but it is sort of telling at where the Academy is at this time and what types of movies it likes to reward. And sometimes they hit like a Braveheart but, or a Titanic, but sometimes, like I talked about with last week, The English Patient was a movie that necessarily translated in the same way that Braveheart is still rewatched. Um, but the sort of maybe presumptive winner at the time is going to be Apollo 13, um, which is Ron Howard's maybe his best movie. Uh, it's a seminal Tom Hanks movie during his sort of peak of Tom Hanks, peak of his career, when he has this great run of, you know, Forrest Gump and Apollo 13 and Toy Story and, you know, Saving Private Ryan and That Thing You Do. You got this sort of great, um, you know, almost decade run where he is the premier movie star and his movies are still well remembered because of how well his choices uh, were as an actor but this is still Ron Howard who's a well acclaimed director this is maybe his best movie it has many quotable lines things like Houston we have a problem which you know stem f f far past from the movie and more into pop culture at this point so it's a movie that is still well remembered and still uh, often watched then there's Sense and Sensibility, based on the Jane Austen novel, who, of course, Jane Austen and the Bronte sisters and that sort of period of literature is still being well-read today, and even still re-adaptations of, of movies like Emma and Little Women are still being made today. So it's still a kind of genre that is still well-appreciated, and I think Sense and Sensibility is, is some of the best. Of course, you have two great movie stars at the helm in Kate Winslet and Emma Thompson, and, you know, actually surprisingly, I think, directed by Ang Lee. Oftentimes when you think of Ang, you may think of Brokeback Mountain or Life of Pi because he won the Oscars for those, but I sometimes forget that he also did this movie. But because I'm a fan of Ang's, I went back and watched this movie because of him. So the movie has a sort of an auteur director tied to it, a well-appreciated director with movie stars based on a well-acclaimed novel. So it's still well-remembered and, and in my mind, kind of the premiere of those types of movies. Then the other Best Picture nominee, which I considered doing, was Babe, just because it was a movie that I saw as a kid. And, you know, when you see movies as a kid, you don't really know if they're well acclaimed or appreciated. You just watch them. And then when you get older, you sort of realize some of them um, were well appreciated and acclaimed, like sort of Disney movies. But then some, like Hook, uh, maybe were less so, but you still sort of enjoyed them all at the time. And Babe was one of those movies that, going back, I was really surprised to, to learn that it was nominated for Best Picture, let alone, you know, well appreciated. Um, but ultimately, 
you know, the, I think the Babe movies are still being shown to children. Of course, it's Bond the sequel, which is directed by George Miller, so there's a little bit of connection there. Um, so it's still sort of being watched, uh, I think, from kids, and it's still sort of a classic family movie. Of course, it repopularized the sort of talking animal movie because um, of that sort of new technology that they developed. So I didn't want to cover that, and ultimately I went with the one movie that I hadn't seen, which was Il Postino, or The Postman in English, um, which was a real historic movie to get nominated at, the, nominated at the time, because the last movie before this that was an international movie that got nominated for Best Picture was Cries and Whispers from uh, Igmar Bergman. So that was sort of the precipice as to why I wanted to cover this movie, because I know about Ingmar Bergen's films that I'd seen, Cries and Whispers, so why was this movie, you know, the sort of next movie to get nominated, as, as acclaimed as that movie was, as Cries and Whispers was at, in, in the 70s, this was at its time. Why was this movie not as well appreciated and wasn't sort of told, uh, told to me as, as a movie I should watch? Um, but the truth is, even though it's been 20 years since a, a movie was nominated for, for Best Picture, an international movie was nominated for Best Picture. Oftentimes, international directors were nominated for Best Director. I mean, in 1974, you had Francois Truffaut. In 1975, you have Fellini. 76, you have Bergman again. So, you know, that's three back to back years where we have international directors. And we still see that today with surprise Thomas Vinterberg nominations and Pavel Pavlikowski nominations for Cold War. We still see the sort of international members of the Academy really sort of push for those kinds of directors. And oftentimes, that's how I watch international cinema is through these sort of great master directors, Truffaut or Kurosawa, that, you know, Michael Radford in this weird way doesn't sort of fall into. And what's even, I guess, stranger in the sense that when we actually do see international movies get nominated for Best Picture, they actually have pretty good track records. Um, you know, the 21st century has been much more favorable as the Academy has become more international. I mean, we have five movies nominated, five international movies have been nominated for Best Picture, where in the 20th century, uh, only, only six were. As a matter of fact, we actually have, we actually had seven this um, century, if you count uh, Letters from Iwo Jima and, and Minari. But I don't, so I really only count it as five. Of course, we also had that Parasite win, so it's a great time for international movies. And, you know, in the 20th century, it really wasn't. That being said, when they were nominated, we got movies like, you know, Grand Illusion and The Emigrants and Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon. Like, in my opinion, those are sort of seminal international movies. So it's strange to see Il Postino sort of lumped in with those movies because I don't think it has that same sort of reputation. So why was this movie that isn't as well acclaimed or tied to a historical movement, why was this so appreciated at the time? Well, I think it really sort of followed, followed a traditional international movie kind of a path where it opens early and then gains a lot of reputation and then at the end of the year shows up on a lot of year-end lists. It was an honorable mention for Roger Ebert. It was a top 10 for the New York Times, honorable mention for the LA Times. So it was a well-appreciated critical movie. And because it was sort of managed by uh, the Weinstein Corporation and Miramax, it was sort of um, pushed over that, that, that finish line and ultimately getting that Best Picture nomination. Of course, you also have the story, the unfortunate story of Massimo Trossi, who is the lead actor and director of the movie, unfortunately died one day after shooting wrapped. So there's a little bit of story added to that, um, which is an unfortunate situation, but of course does lend to some of the, this is the last chance we're gonna nominate this guy who could have been a big star in this really great movie. We kind of have to do it. But in part, that may be a reason why it was ultimately forgotten. But now transitioning into my thoughts, I found this movie to be a really enjoyable watch with relatively low stakes and sort of an easy watch in that sense, particularly when we're with the relationship between Pablo Neruda and the postman played by Massimo Trossi. Um, and that's what the movie's about. It's essentially about Pablo Neruda, who is a communist poet who's living in Chile, who gets exiled and has to live in Italy for, in, in this movie, it's fictionalized, so it's a couple of years, but he really sort of bounced all over Europe. But in this movie, it's about him living on this sort of small island, island off of sort of Sicily, although it's not directly named, um, and him sort of developing a relationship with, with his postman. And really the postman um, learning from Pablo and, uh, learning to love about poetry and becoming a different man. And I think the sort of characters and the relationship between each other is what makes this movie uh, so enjoyable and so interesting. Um, largely because Massimo, he's so great at being able to 
fit within the village. Like he doesn't feel like a complete outsider, but he doesn't fit necessarily the, the rhythms that everyone's a fisherman and that he sort of is doing the motions along with it, but he's not um, totally passionate about it. Um, so he does have that sort of outsider status while still feeling, uh, you know, connected to the island, which I felt, thought it was important. And the community in the town in particular is really well rendered and really um, visualized in that sense. So it feels like Neruda is really the sort of celebrity and, you know, Massimo gets the sort of admiration and respect um, for the man. But maybe even better than Massimo is Pablo Neruda, who's played by Philippe Noré, um, who's also in Cinema Paradiso, who is really great here. I mean, I think he gives the man a sense of earnestness and, and honesty that is sort of both admirable but also sympathetic for. Um, he's someone that, you know, at the beginning of the relationship is very polite and sort of manneristic with, with the postman at the beginning and then realizing the sort of influence that he has sort of provides some wisdom and then ultimately sort of treating him like an equal and, and a friend. So sort of that balance of making him feel like this great, admired, and sort of well-respected poet, but also feeling like a real person is, is really well-balanced and being sort of the teacher, but also wanting to be kind of a friend. This sort of relationship is really well explored, particularly in this middle part of the movie. Now, I do have some other parts of the movie that, you know, Ultimately, the movie I think is well recommending because of this middle part, but the first part getting there takes a good bit of time. The sort of third act really lags um, when the sort of two men split. I also found problems with how the movie dealt with its politics just because it doesn't really, you know, it doesn't have admiration for it or tries to appreciate it with a critical approach. It sort of goes half in, half out. At one point, Massimo talks about being a communist, but I'm definitely not sure he even knows what that exactly means. Um, so, and because, you know, being a communist was so central and integral to Neruda's sort of life, it felt a little bit weird that they kind of tried to deal with it, but they weren't really interested in it. And, and the best parts of the movie are about more about poetry and, and art and, and that kind of creative process more so than it is about the politics, which is a strange in, in a movie about Pablo Neruda. Um, so I would have liked them to either, you know, pick a side, confront it, or maybe show an admiration for it or whatnot, you know, just as long as he's made sort of a critical um, point towards that, I thought it would be a little bit more effective. But because it didn't do that, it was a little bit wishy-washy and maybe a little bit confused um, at that decision. So once again, a little bit strange how such a low stakes movie was dominated for Best Picture, especially an international movie. It doesn't feel like that sort of level of importance because it doesn't really deal with those politics and really only has this really great sort of middle portion. But I understand because of, you know, the co-director and, and actor Massimo Trossi unfortunately dying after the, the shooting wrapped, it did sort of build a little bit of a momentum for his actor. And because he's such a great gives such a great performance in the movie, it's understandable why it ultimately got that Best Picture nomination. But why is it forgotten? Um, like I said, I think at the time, it sort of was propelled because of his death. You know, sometimes that happens, the sort of level of importance was overstated. Um, oftentimes, you know, when we're trying to understand why movies are forgotten, we have to understand why movies are remembered. And international movies are often remembered because of two things. Either they're tied to a well-respected director or they're tied to a, a film movement. So we'll learn about Italian neorealism or you know, French New Wave or Dogma 95 in film school or whatever. So you'll learn about those movies like that are integral to those movements, movements. or you'll learn about you know, Akira Kurosawa or some of the other greats by knowing that, oh, he's a well-respected director, let me watch all his movies. And, and I think for me and a lot of people, that's how they sort of approach international cinema. So because we have a British director here, which we don't really associate with you know, international cinema, because he made other movies in English, you know, with movie stars like 1984, he doesn't really feel like an international director. Um, the, the, of course, the, the main star dies right after this, so it's not like he has other movies that he can sort of leapfrog off of this. Another factor that I think sometimes we have to consider is availability, that this was by far the hardest movie I could find, that it was not available on any uh, streaming service on Netflix. It wasn't on Netflix in any country. It wasn't on any streaming service that I could access. It wasn't even available to rent on an iTunes or something like that. So if you're in North America, it was, it's really difficult just to watch the movie if you want to watch the movie. And this is a best picture winner, so that's un unfortunate. As a matter of fact, I had to watch it on Amazon Prime 
but the English Amazon Prime. So if you don't have a VPN and you don't live there, like it's just really difficult to, to find the movie. So because it's so difficult to find, it's not gonna be as well remembered because people aren't gonna be flipping channels and watch her or they're not gonna see it on Netflix and it's not gonna say best picture nominee or whatever. It's just sort of been forgotten. And because it's not tied to a historical movement or a well-respected international director, it has sort of fallen um, out of favor. I think more so than any other movie, maybe like in the bedroom, this movie has been the most forgotten. I had only known about it by name only. And just the last thing I want to mention is that if you're a fan of old Oscar Countdown, you know that when we're talking about movies for seven, eight months, by the end of the Oscar season, I'm really sick of talking about the movies. I'm sure you're sick about hearing about the movies. You know, you talk about Nomadland for six months, by the end of it, it wins Best Picture, you go, okay, I'm not gonna really think about Nomadland for a while. And sometimes those guys, those movies get sort of picked back up. Um, but then sometimes, you know, they don't. Sometimes they were well appreciated at the time and well talked about at the time. And because people got sort of sick about talking about them, that they sort of fall into that. Um, it was appreciated at the time, but not necessarily a rewatchable movie or a movie that gets the, the need for re, um, acclaim or sort of re-celebration in that sense. And sometimes those movies do get picked back up, but sometimes they get forgotten along the way, which I think more than any other movie we've covered this season, The Postman fits that bill. But that's about it, guys. I hope you enjoyed the video. Make sure you comment below. Let me know if you've seen The Postman, what's your thoughts on it, and any other movies you want me to cover in future episodes as we're starting to wind down. We've got, you know, less than 10 episodes less left. So, you know, TIFF is going to be coming up relatively soon. And, you know, once we get into Venice and whatnot, uh, I plan on re releasing a video sort of a little bit before, or I'd hope to release a video a little bit before the Oscar season actually starts, just to do a little bit of a festival recap and, and get everyone up to speed in terms of the new Oscar rules and stuff like that. So the old Oscar countdown season is coming, um, but right now just stay tuned, stay tight, and enjoy these videos while you've got them. But that's about it. Until next time, stay tuned.